Welcome, everyone. I'm Ray Mayetta, president of Research Talk, and we are here for another one of our qualitative scholar conversations. Today, we are lucky to have time with Dr. Allison Hamilton, uh, not only an independent scholar in her own right, but a wonderful member of Research Talk's consulting team. And we're talking with Allison today about her course um, in our Spring Inquiry series that's offered May 23rd and 24th, so Thursday and Friday. And the course title is Rapid Turnaround Qualitative Research, Strategic Decision-Making for Rigor and Feasibility. And we're gonna get into that course. Alice is gonna give a little bit of her background and then we'll get into content. But first, I just wanted to ask my colleague, Jeff Petrozelli, who's gonna join us in the conversation to introduce himself. Thanks, Ray. Uh, yeah, I'm Jeff Petruzzelli with Research Talk. Uh, I'm a qualitative research specialist here, and I've been with Research Talk since 2001. Thanks. Thanks. So, Allison, if you could start us off, um, maybe a specific part of your professional journey, not only kind of becoming a qualitative researcher, but really to the place you are with your work with Rapid Turnaround. Maybe we'll just kind of slice it there because we could talk for a wonderful, beautiful hour just about your, uh, you know, your background yourself. So why don't we just do it that slice if that works for you? Yeah, definitely. Because I am in the about 10 year zone since I started working on this. I've been doing a lot of reflecting on it, actually. Um, but yes, hello, everyone. I'm Allison Hamilton. Uh, I'm an anthropologist by training and a professor in psychiatry at UCLA and a research career scientist at the VA. And um, so I do a lot of uh, um, health services and implementation research. Um, so very applied, I'm a very applied anthropologist and, and definitely not, uh, was not trained in anything, anything uh, rapid um, in grad school by any means, uh, much more lengthy, ethnographic uh, approaches, traditional ethnographic approaches, which is great. Um, but I started to realize in doing work in these different spaces, uh, grant funded work, um, work that was and is um, heavily partnered in the sense that I might get a request from someone to do a particular um, project that is is very rapid cycle. So um, you know, we want to know about X or Y, we need to know about it by, you know, in six months because we're shaping some policy about it. Um, we're working on a new clinical practice or revisions to a practice. And I just started to realize over time that um, my ways of doing things were not really uh, completely well suited for that um, very sort of responsive um quicker turnaround, deliverable oriented type of work. And so within our sort and sift, think and shift um, method that, that Ray and Jeff and several others who aren't here developed with research talk, um, within that, you know, we have this idea of um, having a very, building a very solid understanding of each data collection episode um, through what are called um, episode profiles. And it just started to strike me that there would there could be a way of creating episode profiles and moving from those to other tools that might kind of fit the bill with this more rapid turnaround work. Um, it does tend to be more targeted, more focused, because again, the requests are coming for pretty specific areas of inquiry. Um, you know, people might want to know about um, a new intervention or a new practice um, and how people are thinking about it, how they might be responding to it as they're using it. And that the information that we gather qualitatively um, is, is going to be used and applied, you know, potentially rather quickly, relatively speaking, not years and years later after you've done, you know, uh, lots and lots of different types of analyses. And so um, I've just been working, you know, with with our research talk team and and many other colleagues on figuring out how we can, you know, take advantage of this incredible moment um, that's been, you know, a couple, uh, at least a decade in the making of of qualitative methods being increasingly relied on for work like this, which is 
great for those of us who do this type of work um, because our work is, is needed and wanted and valued and prioritized in qualitative methods um, and do it in a way that is, is responsive and is productive and informative uh, all the while being feasible. <laughs> Feasibility is a really big part of this. You know, how can we do things with our qualitative methods within these more constrained timeframes, need for products, um, and need for that, um, that kind of correspondence between what's being asked for and what's being delivered. I love it. It's great. It's uh, you did a really nice job kind of connecting the your evolutions to this with giving us already a flavor for you know the content that's going to be in the course and i i want to go to a question we normally ask later in the conversation but um this is a real practical topic a lot of the folks who take your course they come from very different fields um, lots of different industries lots of different disciplines things like that um when you think about post course let's go here first and then we'll go back more deeply into the course um, content and you know shapes and things what do you envision that people will start integrating like if you think about them at their desk after the course what do you hope people kind of are like short-term and long-term kind of how it changes the way they work with the information? It's a great question. And, you know, of course, this, I'm, I'm by far not the first person to think about using qualitative methods rapidly. There's a strong history of this in public health and in, you know, many other areas. Um, and, and I, you know, really, try to build on all, all of that amazing work um, that's been done and equip people with a sort of orientation to doing more rapid turnaround work um, that needs to, that, that orientation needs to really be at the forefront of even designing the project. So I think with rapid turnaround work, I pay a lot more attention to, of course, my timeline, but also like where, what is my um, end goal within that timeline? And I wanna have that thinking as I'm designing the project. So to get to this report I have to create, this summary I have to deliver, this presentation I'm gonna have to give, um, you, you know, usually it's not an, an academic type of product for some of these projects, at least within those timelines. Um, how am I going to get there? And and putting that intentionality um, at the forefront of the design, because sometimes people find themselves like, oh, I've got to, you know, turn this thing around really quickly, but I didn't really set up my project to be able to do that. And so what I hope that people will get from this is kind of how do we back our way into what we're ultimately going to need to have to deliver um, by thinking about just, you know, feasible design strategies, feasible data collection approaches, feasible data analysis approaches that, um, and carrying the, you know, mission of the project from, you know, through from the very beginning of what's, you know, what are going to be some optimal ways of setting this up so that I can get to that endpoint that's probably been determined by someone else um, and do what, what I've been asked or, you know, um, what I've been asked to do. And um, so there's there's that real practicality to it. Um, and, you know, that forward thinking about, you know, I'm trying to get to a particular place, a particular deliverable product, et cetera, and what are going to be some ways that I can get there that will be feasible for me and, and for my team. So we do think a lot in this work about, you know, it's going to be the, the rapidness, <laughs> the speed at which you can do this work is gonna be greatly enhanced by doing it in a team. So we also wanna bring into this and, and what I think people will come away with is not only how can we approach this type of work, but approach it in a more team-based um, orientation. Um, and what does it mean for data collection, data analysis to be happening in a team-based manner? And again, how can we kind of optimize 
those processes and thinking through our design components with a with an eye toward this is going to be happening on a team um, and how can we get that consistency uh, that responsiveness kind of built into what we do as a team. Jeff, what about uh, what do you tell? You know, invite, I want to invite you into the conversation because I know you're you're familiar with this and seen a lot. So yeah, what are you thinking? Yeah, Allison, I I know a lot of this is embedded in what you've talked about already, but uh, I just uh, looking at your course title, the, the the back end of it is strategic decision making for rigor and feasibility, and uh, that notion of rigor always comes up in qualitative research. So we want to make sure that we're showing rigor in everything we do. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, and this is mentioned in the description, but if you could go into a little more detail on uh, fostering and maintaining rigor while you're doing this type of rapid work. Um, I think that's something that, uh, you know, people assume that if you're doing something rapid, it may not be as rigorous as, you know, if you're, if you're kind of on a, on a longer, longer term path. So yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, it's been a it's been a very uh, frequent theme these days, um, which is exactly as you said that there is concern and and it's often expressed by people who might not be familiar or comfortable with more rapid qualitative work um, that if it is done quickly, that it can't and won't be done rigorously. And what I've tried to do with this approach is look at a lot of different rubrics of rigor and qualitative um, methodology. And, and there are many, um, you know, some are perhaps even leaning a little bit more quantitative. Some are, um, you know, kind of posing alternatives to more quantitative leading um, metrics or uh, notions of what rigor means. Um, and I try to really speak the language of a variety of approaches to rigor because people are going to be calling on different um, conceptualizations of rigor. Um, but I would say across the board, and this has been um, as intentional as possible on my part, is that when I look at, you know, features of rigor, um, uh, you know, being clear about your um, conceptual or theoretical approach and carrying that through the work, um, using a um, having a reflexive stance throughout the work. Um, it might involve things like some type of member checking, maybe, maybe not. Um, but if we look through like all the different ways in which people have conceptualized rigor, um, I've tried to demonstrate, and I will you know, talk this through in the course, that these are not at odds with what we do and, and really can't and shouldn't be at odds with what we do in rapid turnaround work. So we're not trying in rapid turnaround work, we're not trying to do things in this sort of quick and dirty and unthinking, you know, let me just knock out some interviews and and throw some things at the wall. And that's that's that. I mean, we're, we still want to imbue this whole process with, with the fundamental core principles of good qualitative work, credible qualitative work, developing trustworthy findings, um, and using the techniques uh, within our design and within our execution of these projects that correspond and align with principles of rigor. Um, and that includes how we do this work as a team, um, how we're um, taking uh, opportunities throughout data collection and analysis to think about what we know so far, uh, reflect on where we're at, think about whether things need to pivot in the project. And so it does, it does, as with, you know, what I was saying before, it does mean thinking about rigor from the beginning and carrying that through all of these processes um, and not, you know, not veering away from uh, sort of core um, approaches to and notions of rigor just because we're doing things in a more rapid timeline. Um, so that's a, that's good. I think that's even, I think it's more a part of this course than it ever has been, honestly, um, because when I first started teaching this um, over 10 years ago for Research Talk, um, you know, it was, it just wasn't as fully integrated as it is now. Um, and I think partially because of the response to it, um, to work done in this way, um, I've really had to develop that part of it a lot more. And it's, and like I said, it's more, a much more front and center with how I teach this course now than it ever has been. 
So it'll actually be, you know, people who have even taken it before might be at a different point in their work. Um, and they'll, they'll hear different things from me on that topic this year than I've ever shared before, because I've been you know, really trying to build this piece out. Great. You know, it really seems knitted through in such an intimate way now, um, rigor, um, in kind of, you know, having a little bit of role. And as you develop this, I've seen that, you know, that just kind of like, you know, what you introduce to researchers as far as, you know, everything from conceptualization of the project to, okay, we got stuff out. Um, all of it is just don't do it unless it's yep. markers of rigor. It's just fabulous. I was wondering as we, um, you know, there's a couple more questions before we close out. Could you give us like an example of a project that, you know, could be recent, it could be a favorite, uh, what the topic was and what the products and what kind of happened as a result of, you know, here's something that we introduced a rapid turnaround qualitative research approach. Um, you know, a couple of highlights of what you did and kind of what resulted from it. Yeah, um, many things flooded my mind at the same time. I think one uh, kind of series of projects that I've done have been um, partnered in the VA with uh, with in in women's health. Um, and uh, without getting into too many details, there was some concern overall about um, burnout among primary care uh, providers and uh, a request from our partners to understand what does burnout mean to people? How does it affect them? Um, if they don't have, you know, if they aren't experiencing it, why do they think others might be? What steps are taken to address burnout in the system, both individual level and organizational level um, steps that are being taken? So really trying to just develop an understanding of, of this phenomenon from the perspective of those providers. Um, so not, you know, what do we already know about burnout or you know, lots of theories about it, measures of it, et cetera, but what does it actually look like in people's day-to-day -day work lives if they are experiencing it or are working with people who are experiencing it or both? Um, and we, um, you know, these projects tend to be pretty quick um, really ultimately less than a year. We might have a full year, but that involves all the different regulatory steps and so forth. And we were able to um, do a lot of interviews very quickly with a very targeted sample. So that kind of gets into those ingredients of this approach um, to ask, you know, what is what does this mean for you? How do you experience it? Um, what are the implications of it? How do you get help for it, et cetera? And it's, um, and we were, uh, in terms of what we needed to produce, you know, we often do brief presentations, um, reports. These are the types of things that come out of these projects like this. Like, here's what we've learned from providers in the system. Um, here are some steps that some of some sites have taken to address burnout. Um, we have presented it. Uh, at many different types of, um, in many venues like um, field leaders, meetings, administrators, you know, when we think about audience, that's one of the big things we think about with, with rapid turnaround work is what are we, what are we trying to convey to usually a variety of audiences? Um, and so it had a lot of practical implications, next steps, action items, here are things that we can think about doing as a system, things that I may or may not have anything to do with, but just, just sharing those perspectives from the field so that additional actions and steps could be taken um, in response to what we were learning with that data that, again, was very much in the words of the people who were delivering care in, in primary care. Um, and, and that has continued on for a few years um, because there's kind of, I think there's, I, I mean, I'm so grateful that that the value of the qualitative data is seen and respected and embraced um, because there's kind of no substitute for hearing from folks themselves about what this means to them and how it's affecting them. Um, and I just think that 
qualitative uh, methods are so well suited to explore something like that, that has a very often a very personal dimension, very experiential dimension, but also that organizational and contextual, um, those levels to it as well. So it's just been, you know, such an honor to do that work and to think, oh, these interviews that my team and I get to do actually help people to, you know, think about what to do next and what to do as a system is, you know, it's very, very satisfying, very gratifying. It's great too. And it epitify, uh, epitomizes for me a quality of all of your work. Um, and it's, you know, I don't know where I've ever told you, but it's been such an honor knowing you as long as we've been friends, kind of watching um, and seeing the scholarship you produce is even in the practice heavy stuff, it's by no means divorced from publishable, thoughtful work that can contribute to the concrete conversation. And again, you know, I use knitting together in a different context early, but you're just so skillful at knitting together the kind of substantive process oriented, you know, that could be a theory based article or whatever it might be with, and here's how it directs us to get things done. It's just- Well, and just to add one thing, because I get very excited about this stuff, but I think one other um, thing that I would just love to to add to our very brief video is that there is there can be a concern that nothing emergent can come out of rapid. And I just think that that's completely not the case. And so even if we take this burnout example um, for just a moment, we we discovered things in the process of doing those interviews that um, really surprised us. So we learn, for example, about not only when people are experiencing burnout, what that means, but why do they stay? And so we've developed a whole line of inquiry around people who stayed in their roles and developed a line of kind of practical work that can be done around retention. And we didn't know we were going to learn about that in these interviews at first. You know, and so there's we want to build and construct and work, do this work in a way that allows for those opportunities for emergent discovery, which is why we do qualitative work to begin with. And so I, I really want to emphasize that in this course, again, probably more than ever in, um, before, we get into how do we create that space? What does that look like? How can we do this work and not be completely you know, locked into, I have to do A, B, and C, but also leave that room for discovery and for emergent um, emergent findings. So that's been pretty exciting in the evolution of this too. It's so critical. That's such a great component. Well, not only thank you for taking the time to talk with us today, but you know, just thank you for your thoughtful, mindful, um, wise approaches that to everything you do and what you contribute to the folks who come to Research Talk. Um, we would not be Research Talk without you. So oh. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so for the much. opportunity. Uh, thank you, Jeff, also for um, your contributions today. And um, let us uh, close out there. And we're looking forward May 23rd, May 24th, um, Rapid Turnaround Qualitative Research, Strategic Decision Making for Rigor and Fe Feasibility with Allison Hamilton. Hope to see you there. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>